have you heard about faith and transformation? Well, in this lesson, we will learn about using our unique gifts. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be a part of our Sunday school? Then subscribe. Hi, I'm Regina Dean Reed, and I teach Sunday school at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Maven, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. And today's lesson is Faith and Transformation. Our devotional reading is Ezekiel, the 11th chapter, verses 17 through 21. Our background scripture is Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 8. And our key verse is Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 6a. Today's date is January 28, 2024. Let's start with a prayer. Father, you have called all of your servants to serve. Help us to realize our gifts and give us the courage to develop and use them for your glory. Help us to remember that no matter what our gifts are, we are all members of one body and that no one is unimportant to your church and to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lesson aims. Number one, list several spiritual gifts. Number two, Compare and contrast the printed text with the gift list in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and Ephesians, the 4th chapter. And number three, create a plan to use a spiritual gift more effectively. Lesson Introduction A young boy named Valar, who is four years old, has a strong interest in the human body. His favorite book is one that explains the different parts of the body, and he enjoys lifting the tab to see the internal organs and bones. When he had the opportunity to attend a free medical exam at a local clinic, he was eager to learn more. He was particularly excited about getting an x-ray to see how his body fits together. But unfortunately, he was too young for it, while his siblings were not. This disappointment led him to beg for an x-ray picture throughout the trip home. The situation made his family reflect on how Christians should also take as much interest in understanding how the body of Christ fits together. They believed that if this were the case, churches would be healthier and members would appreciate each other more. Lesson Context Paul wrote the book of Romans around AD 58, near the end of his third missionary journey. Although he didn't Although he hadn't been to Rome yet, he really wanted to go there. Eventually, he did make it to Rome in about A.D. 61, but as a prisoner under house arrest. He wrote the letter to the church in Rome to introduce himself and his teaching before visiting them in person. The church had likely been established not long after Pentecost, about 30 years earlier, possibly by Jews from Rome who had heard Peter's sermon on that day. It is clear that the Roman church had heard of Paul and was looking forward to meeting him. The book of Romans has sparked a big debate about the kind of people who made up the Roman church when Paul wrote it. Were they mostly Jewish, mostly Gentile, or an even mixed? Although it's likely that the church was started by Jewish believers, Paul suggests that it was mainly made up of Gentiles. The Roman Emperor Claudius kicked out Jews from Rome in about AD 49, which probably led to more Gentile believers joining the church. By the time Paul wrote this letter, Claudius had died and Jews were allowed back in Rome. We don't know for sure how many Jewish believers there were in the Roman church, but Paul does talk a lot about Israel in Romans the ninth chapter verses 1 through 11 and verse 12. Still, he speaks directly to Gentiles in Romans the 11th chapter verse 13. So most signs point to there being more Gentiles than Jews in the Roman church. The book of Romans can be split into two main parts. The first part, Romans first chapter through 11th chapter, has some really heavy teaching. 
Then Paul talks about how Christians should live based on these teachings. Today's lesson is from the second section. Lesson scriptures. Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 8. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. In this verse, Paul explains that understanding God's will starts with how we think of ourselves. He emphasizes the importance of renewing our minds and thinking rationally. Paul's authority comes from God, and he sets a standard for self-evaluation based on faith. The specific type of faith he refers to is debated, but the focus is on a personal growth rather than comparison to others. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Paul refers to the analogy of the human body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. It is clear that different body parts have different functions. A hand can't function as an ear, and vice versa. The word office here doesn't refer to a specific church role but rather to deeds or actions as seen in Romans 8th chapter, verse 13, and Colossians the 3rd chapter, 9th verse. Verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Paul wanted his readers to see the collective unity of many as one. Just as Christians need each other to serve effectively, the body needs Christ as its head. Paul emphasized these ideas in multiple places in his writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, and the fourth chapter, verse 12 and verse 25, and Colossians first chapter, verse 18 and verse 24. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, for the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. The influence of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11 is strong here. Along with the following two verses, Paul introduces the gift of prophecy as one of seven different gifts divided into groups of four and three. Paul emphasizes using this gift appropriately. In the New Testament era, prophecy mainly involves sharing divinely revealed information for the church's benefit rather than predicting the future. The message of a prophet was evaluated by others with the same gift. It is important to avoid hastily making lists of spiritual gifts based on this text without seeing the bigger picture. Spiritual gifts are meant to unite a diverse group and build it up as a whole, not just benefit individuals, and they should be expressions of love among believers. Verse 7, our ministry. Let us wait on our ministering or he that teaches on teaching. Paul discusses the second gift in his list of four. The word ministry can also be translated as serve in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 31. And it refers to the work Christians do for others. Paul uses this word to describe different types of service, including Christian ministry in general, the ministry of Christ, specific Christian ministries, and the ministry of the office of deacon. He likely refers to a specific gift of service that qualifies a person from the office of deacon. The gift of teaching is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 through 29, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. In our text, verse 7 continued, Paul focuses on he that teacheth rather than the gift of teaching itself. Teaching is distinct from prophesying because it involves communicating the truth of the gospel. In the early church, in the early church, teaching was crucial because most people didn't have formal education and learned through listening rather than reading. This is why the elders had the important responsibility of teaching. First Timothy, the third chapter and the second verse, and then the fifth chapter in the 17th verse. Verse 8, or he that exhorted 
on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Paul identified the fourth spiritual gift as the ability to encourage others. He uses the words exhorteth and exhortation a total of 80 times in his letters, with 60 occurrences translated as comfort, beseech, or exhort. The remaining 20 times are translated as comfort, consolation, or exhortation. This suggests that those with the gift should use, use it to gently challenge others, falling between a simple request and a strong command. Moving on to the first of three less defined spiritual gifts, Paul emphasizes the importance of sharing what one has with others. Verse 8 continued. The word translated as simplicity appears eight times in the New Testament. Always in Paul's letters, it is translated elsewhere as liberality, bountifulness, and singleness of heart. This reflects the idea that giving should be done with a sincere and single-minded purpose, without any hidden agendas. Acts, the fifth chapter, verses one through four. Being merciful involves more than just saying sympathetic words or forgiving. Jesus said that those who show mercy will receive mercy. There are no specific ways of being merciful mentioned. But it's important to be merciful because we have received mercy from God. Giving is also a way of showing mercy. Love is the key to using any spiritual gift. And these three gifts, prophecy, service, and teaching, are expected of all Christians. Isn't it important for everyone to take charge of their own lives to avoid being unproductive? Shouldn't everyone show mercy? And these are our questions. Write the questions in the comments below. One, how can you show mercy to others in the, the week ahead? Two, how can a believer use their gift of giving without only thinking about giving money? And three, how will you figure out your spiritual gift and how to use it for the church? Conclusion. We acknowledge the importance of all spiritual gifts, but recognize that they are not all equal and believers are not equally gifted. It is common to focus more on the visible gifts such as those of a preacher rather than the less visible ones like the custodian. However, just as different body parts work together, all gifts are essential. Those with more visible gifts should be wary of pride and those with less visible gifts should not neglect them. Similar to how human body needs all its parts working together to function at its best. The church, as the body of Christ, also needs all members using their spiritual gifts to reach its full potential. To avoid pride or neglect of gifts, remember Luke, the 17th chapter, verse 10. We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty. And I thought to remember, know your spiritual gifts and use them with humility. Our Sunday school teacher training will be on a Thursday. Still hadn't picked a day, a day yet but it will be between seven and eight. It'll be in the community tab and I will start announcing it. If you have enjoyed this lesson, give us a thumbs up, share this lesson, get into a Bible study group, whether online or in person, get your shots, stay six feet apart, wear your mask, love each other, pray for each other, and I will see you all next week.